Good evening and thank you all very much for coming. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you from uh, 9.9 .9 Media and Ink India Magazine. Uh, most of you know me, but for those of you who don't, my name is Pramad Senha and I'm one of the founders of 9.9 .9 Media and uh, with Anuradha Mathur and uh, Shreyasi, uh, I run uh, 9.9 .9 Media as well as publish the Ink India Magazine. Uh, it's especially a pleasure to have you here because uh, it is Friday evening and there's lots of traffic out there uh, and those of you who have been here since the afternoon may not know but it's actually turned much colder outside than it was uh, this morning and yesterday evening. Uh, so it's nicer to be inside and uh, appreciate you all being here. Just a few words, uh, for some of you this will be repetition but uh, I know that some of you were not here this afternoon about the uh, innovation. Uh, hundred. Uh, when our team decided that they wanted to do yet another list, uh, I was quite skeptical because uh, everywhere people are talking about innovation and uh, there are already quite a few awards on innovation in India. Uh, but when I actually understood why they wanted to do it, I thought it was worth a shot. Uh, and now that we have completed this exercise, I think you will agree that uh, it was certainly worth doing. Uh, some of the reasons for why we decided to create yet another list uh, is that, as you know, we have been doing the Inc. 500 list for quite some time now. Uh, and what is unique about that list is that it looks at which are the fastest growing companies in the mid-size segment. Uh, We've often got a lot of flack for why we do mid-size. Everybody wants us to call them SMEs or startups and so on. Uh, the reason we focus on that segment is because we believe that these are the companies that will be in the next ET 500 or the Business World 500 or the Business Standard 500 and we feel that nobody really focuses on these companies and that they are going to be the winners in the future and they need to be recognized as well. So we've actually focused on that group uh, and we, we call them the mid-sized companies which roughly runs from about 50 odd crores all the way up to 1500 crores. Is that right? Uh, and uh, as we were doing these lists we suddenly realized that there was something else going on in these companies. Uh, and, and that was quite fascinating that it was not just about creating a new fantastic innovative product. When we think of innovation everybody thinks of some innovative product. But that people were actually doing lots of innovative things uh, with their business system, within certain functions, uh, and that it was not just about coming up with some sexy, flashy, cute product. Uh, it, it was about doing very simple things in a very tough operating environment that India is, and I say this with lots of stars on my back because I turned on floor six years ago uh, after working in the large multinational world for most of my life. And I can tell you that it is very, very, very difficult to operate in India. And for people to innovate in that environment was something we thought was truly creditable and something that we should celebrate. So we did look at how other people do these awards. Uh, and, and, and as you know, there are other awards that are done for innovation. We felt that we should look at innovation in the business system and within the function, and that's why we have 10 categories, uh, as most of you know. Uh, it's actually in the magazine today, which just came out with a special issue, so I won't repeat them, but it's almost like looking at innovation by each part of the organization, whether it is marketing, branding, supply chain, manufacturing, uh, governance uh, and so on. Uh, we were overwhelmed that nearly 400 companies uh, applied for this process or were nominated in this process. Uh, we were very lucky to have some uh, uh, very distinguished jury members who agreed to guide us. Uh, some of them are here today and I won't name all of them right now but uh, you will see them come on stage to give these awards and I have to say that uh, Unlike a lot of media companies that do this, I as one of the owners was not involved in that process at all. Uh, uh, the, the jury members independently have uh, reviewed all the cases and decided uh, who are the people who deserve to be on the list. So I just wanted to set the context for uh, what this uh, uh, 
this list is about. I hope that we will continue in the same way in which we have continued the Ink India 500, that we will continue to do these lists every year. Uh, at least uh, uh, I hope that I will have, we will have your support to encourage your own companies and other companies to keep applying year after year uh, for these uh, awards and for this list. I'd like to again welcome you all here. Thank you for being here. And uh, I particularly want to thank the jury members because I know that some of them are my friends and they are very, very busy people and that they've uh, devoted time not just to the awards but to also come here today. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, this is something that one should do in the end but I may not have a chance to do this but I'd like to congratulate my team at Inc, uh, Shreyasi, Anuradha, Rajat and others uh, for putting this together uh, as, as a new idea for us for this year. I uh, am particularly happy to be here today because of uh, the chance to introduce and welcome a very uh, dear friend. Uh, uh, Prithviraj Chaudhary is an assistant professor at uh, Harvard Business School. PC has all the uh, credentials that you would want to see in your son and daughter if you are trying to educate them. He went to an IIT, then went to an IIM, then did his PhD at Harvard. He taught at Wharton, uh, worked at McKinsey, which is where I met him. Uh, is now back at uh, Harvard Business School, uh, works with Clayton Christensen and who has not heard of his name when it comes to innovation, in fact teaches one of his courses and is mentored by him. <coughs> so uh, amazing credentials uh, for, for a man who is actually quite young uh, and, and as he comes up on stage he could pass off for one of our sons or daughters if you look at him physically. Uh, what most people don't know about and this is something, everything else you can read about PC but uh, by the way, it's Prithviraj Chaudhary, but we call him PC. The, the one thing that don't, people don't know about PC, and I didn't know about this till he actually called himself this, but I thought he was a much uh, broader musician. But uh, he, he goes by uh, as a singer and songwriter. Uh, I know that he also plays a couple of uh, instruments. Uh, he's recorded a CD. Uh, he, he sings uh, and, and records in Bengali. Uh, he's done live concerts around the world. Uh, and uh, he has just uh, written his first Hindi song uh, and the Hindi song is just going to be recorded and released on Republic Day uh, and I hope I'm not giving away too much, is it okay? <laughs> uh, and it's about how uh, you make the shift from Bharat to India and, and, and bring Bharat to India is, is his theme. Uh, so I think uh, what, what we are about to witness and, and PC in a few minutes will uh, give us his keynote address uh, and nothing more appropriate than to have somebody who researches innovation to talk about uh, innovation on a, on a day like this. Uh, but uh, this, this is one aspect of PC that I think we won't get to see today but uh, maybe some, uh, if, you, if you can look out for uh, his music. Uh, I also believe that, uh, I didn't know this, he told me today that PC is also writing poetry in, in Bengali now. So I don't know how you find time to do all of these things, PC. But thank you for agreeing to be here. I just caught him because he was coming to India on his annual vacation and I thought, uh, why not uh, bring him over for this uh, event? So it's great to have him here. I'd like you to come on stage, PC, and uh, please uh, unveil the uh, Innovation 100. <laughs> to all the winners. It's a lovely event. I was sitting through some of the presentations. So I can tell Akash, like the idea you're pursuing is something I thought about, uh, you know, when I was in IIT Kharagpur, so great work. Uh, so we started the, set, the whole day with Anuradha talking about how the word innovation is abused. And I totally agree that that is the case. You know, the word innovation is used as a panacea for almost everything. 
So I study innovation as a living, and hopefully I can defend my trade. But I would actually argue that we should use the word more. Just given where, so I, I, I do a lot of research in India. I come, come to uh, India almost four or five times a year. And just given where the companies are, especially the mid-sized companies, I think it's, it's great that we are starting to use the word, uh, and we should keep using the word more and more. So I teach a course on innovation, which is over 28 sessions, 80 minutes each. So my first innovation was to select the key messages that I can deliver in 20 minutes. So let me tell you three stories, and then uh, as I read the stories, maybe some, some sort of like conceptual frameworks will come by. So as you can see, the, the talk today is focused on innovation for mid-sized companies, and I use the exact phrase that Pramit suggested we use, in emerging markets. And let me start with this company called BYD. Anyone heard about this company? It's a Chinese company. And uh, any guesses for why it's called BYD? It's actually bring you dollars. It's that's so it was a company which, which started in 1995 by a very entrepreneurial man, and they started making batteries, lithium ion batteries, nickel cadmium batteries. And this was at a time when the Japanese uh, manufacturers were really dominant with world class plants, economies of scale, churning out batteries, even for the Chinese markets. And this gentleman, he sort of took on the, uh, the, the Japanese multinationals. So he is, uh, he is the entrepreneur, Charles Wang. Probably like, had great ambitions like all of you. So back in 1995, he didn't have any access to any of these world-class Japanese plants. So what he said is, OK, I'm groping in the dark. Let me not try to imitate. Let me just recreate in my own way the process of making a battery. And the single theme that he sort of like picked on given what the, the, the resources that were available to him was this theme called decapitalization. So what decapitalization really means is that you use the available resource in China, which is labor, and you substitute labor and process innovation. So it's not only about labor, and I'll, I'll give you examples of how labor is leveraged to get process innovation, but you use labor and process innovation put together to substitute for automation, and what, what CapEx can do for you. So let me show you some pictures, and maybe the pictures will tell the story. So this is one of the battery sort of like uh, floors. And these are all coil winding machines. So what it does is a very basic operation. It takes the anode sheet and the cathode sheet and winds them together. And as you can see, most of the workers are women, very young women coming from the provinces who stay on campus and sitting in a line. There are two assembly lines, one on the top, one on the bottom. So you pick up like a kit from the top, you do your winding, you put it back on the bottom. So it's clearly a lot of labor, and this is not how the Japanese multinationals would do this process. Let me keep showing you a few more pictures. So this is what is known as a, an example of a jig. Because in battery manufacturing, you have to be very, very precise in certain steps. And that's why you use automation, right? There's a reason the Japanese use automation. And the human hands, you know, however cheap the wages might be, is not that precise. So what Charles Wan figured out was if we use jigs or these small stands, that would give us the stability and the precision. And his sort of motto was jigs plus labor is equal to automation. So this is completely sort of invented by BYD in China. All these jigs for the, the nickel cadmium winding process. As you can see, like this is how the quality control was set up. A lot of English signage, because he was actually also innovating and in trying to impress all the investors and his customers that quality control is a huge deal here. And finally, this is a great example. This is something which is, so battery manufacturing, for the people who know that industry or the manufacturing process, need this dry room, the complete sort of air-free room, where you put these chemicals at a certain temperature and pressure, and with well, with the presence of air, that whole process gets disturbed. And the way the Japanese plants were set up was they had these huge sort of like dry rooms where people were physically working inside. Now, Wang had no access, he had never seen a Japanese plant. So what he set up was a really small room and then people just putting their hands inside. So the worker is not inside, it's just the hands inside. So immediately, you cut out uh, the cost of setting up these huge air-free vacuum control rooms. And yet, he was doing this because he was just using his instincts of saying, 
कितने कम खर्चे में मैं ये स्टेप कर सकता सो ही वॉज जस्ट एंड ही एक्चुअली नॉट है एक्सेस टू द नो हाउ द जैपनीज टर्न द पुलिस प्लस है so this is a classic example of using labor using process innovation to decapitalize the automotive process of the japanese were doing and one more example of process innovation so you can see two women here and i don't know whether it's very clear so the, the, the woman at the back is using the scalp the scalpel kind of thing so what they're doing is they're taking out this patch this red this red patch from the battery so in the japanese uh, manufacturing process these two steps are one single process there's one machine which would which take out this red thread and throw it out so what wax factory does is two people and one person is just taking out the red thing and the other person is just like piercing it and taking it out and you don't have to rest the scalpel on the desk and that's why it's two different people now he is designing all of this ground up with no knowledge of the existing sort of like benchmark So this is this is a great example again of labor and process innovation leading to a uh, replacing what 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 the machine would do. So having done this very successfully, he started by supplying batteries for Chinese toys uh, toy manufacturers and then essentially took over a very large market share of the of, of the Chinese battery market. He sort of decided to become ambitious. So here's my first sort of like this uh, your message for because you know you you, you all are in, uh, are in these diverse industries but i think the thing that we can really learn from byd is ambition any guesses for what he gets into next what is the next industry he gets into uh, car fab building any other mobile guesses toys toys mobile mobile phones <coughs> that's a, that, that's a very even sort of thing to the obvious guess right autos what is the connection you think between batteries and autos right So what happened just historically there was a there was a loss making or semi loss making auto plant being run by the government in a province called Xi'an it was a Quinchin uh, plant and they personally through the you know the state owned entity system in China is very very sort of dense so he knew some people through his provincial government who were sort of like connecting him to the other province and he said okay i have done this for like 7 8 years now i've really mastered this art of battery manufacturing Can I take decapitalization to the to the world of autos? Okay, and let me give you the sort of punchline. What happens? So he he decides to buy this auto manufacturing plant, which is like significantly higher orders of magnitude in terms of the complexity of what he's trying to achieve, right? And he builds this new production facility. He takes over the existing state-owned entity uh, operation, and he builds a new production facility on top of that. and he introduces a car called F3 which is the highest selling car in China in 2010 so it's really really successful let, let me uh, let me show you how the decapitalization lesson was taken from the context of batteries and transported into autos so the first thing that he did was he said okay i know how to do batteries well let me think about electric cars because turns out that in the variable cost of making an, an electric car 40% is really a battery and i know batteries really well right So he launches an electric car. Obvious uh, thing. So he's actually using one of his capabilities in this new industry, and he's sort of getting recognized as one of the most innovative companies in the world. So this is a business week ranking, and this is where you know uh, you you should be in a few years. Business week like top hundred. Look at how the shift has happened in terms of the revenue mix. So 2005, the first column. Batteries is 76% of his revenue. In 2011, only 12%. So cell phones is actually part of what he he also does, but autos is now 44% of the business. And let me show you now how this decapitalization lesson was taken from batteries to autos. So this is what he sort of like he sort of like got from the. This was the sort of the car that the state-owned entity was doing. It was called Flyer. Not exciting. So he, he he takes that and he builds this, and this is called F3, and I would argue this is actually partly designed by Toyota. So he was just like picking by design, right? And if you look at the logo, it's very inspired by BMW. But the real thing is this. So this is an example of the stamping operations of the auto. This is this looks like any other automotive plant anywhere in the world, like in Detroit or anywhere in India. next to that big stamping machine he puts this labor intensive mini stamping operations 
So if you can see, the stamping operation is all sort of men working, like the traditional auto like shop floor. The small stamping machine floor is all women working. So he's taking the exact battery model into office, right? So he's he's doing whatever it needs to be done on that big stamping machine, but taking partly part of the stamping job to be small stamping lines. So this is uh, like I love this picture because you would never see this in Detroit, right? So the, just look at the ropes holding the car at the top, and the way the tilt is just using two people who literally take a piece of rope and tilt it, right? So, and by doing that, he's cutting out automation. He's just using his labor and process innovation. This, this has never been done by any <coughs> Western auto manufacturer, this process step. Uh, this is an example of how he is using labor to put the windshield. Uh, so he just takes it offline of the assembly line, he puts the NSA of the workers, and he puts it back. In, in, in Detroit, this is all automated. And finally, uh, I love this picture because if something doesn't work, you have the hammer and you can just take the mallet and, and make things work, right? And the government responds. So once you get to like being successful in your first attempt, and just through pure ambition, like saying, I learned something in batteries, which is decapitalization. Let me take that capability. And when he's successful, the government sort of like sees that as a great signal, and the government passes subsidies for his, his real ambitious pet project, which is the, the food efficient electric car. Right? So that is getting support. So this is one sort of story from China. And to summarize this story, this is the concept I want to leave, it, uh, leave you with. This is the concept of strategic hinges. So you, all of you are in a certain business. And the way I would argue is, you get to know your business really well, but get to know also what you do really well. And that is your strategic hinge. And as you become more and more ambitious going ahead, use that hinge to figure out where to go next. So in the case of the auto, uh, the battery store auto story, the hinge really is the product market, which is the battery-driven electric car. That's one of the hinges. The process, which is coil winding. So he knows coil winding really well. But the real capability is decapitalization. So figure out what your strategic hinge is as you move from education to something else, as you move from cement, you know, cleaning to something else. So ambition is the first uh, sort of big picture message. Now let me move to the second sort of like theoretical framework, and I'm trying to cram a lot like in 20 minutes. So this is a framework that Clayton Christians and my colleagues sort of has like championed over years. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think being a mid-sized company is actually an opportunity. And I'll, I'll show you why. So uh, I, I'm guessing many, many people have seen this model of disruptive innovation, right? So how many people know about disruptive innovation? Uh, so, sort of to summarize what disruptive innovation is, and this is Clay Christensen's sort of like big, big sort of like contribution to, to the field of innovation. The idea is that you take an existing technology and you really invent a new business model, and you take that technology into a, into a product, uh, into a, into a market, and you slowly eat into that market bottom up. And let me show you an example of exactly how. So disruptive innovation is take an existing technology, completely revolutionize the business model, and enter a market bottom up. So the classic disruptive innovation story is what happened with mini mills and integrated steel manufacturers. So what, what you sort of like see in the story is over time, 1975-1995, how mini mills took on the integrated steel manufacturers in the US. So when they entered, so the, the sort of like the, the horizontal line are the products ranked by margins. So rebars are the lowest margin products, 7%, going up to angle irons, to structural steel, and sheet steel is like really, really high margin. So the disruptor, which is the mini mill, which has essentially got this very different business model of taking scrap, melting it, and producing steel, is taking on the integrated steel manufacturers through this new business model, but at the bottom of the pyramid of margins. So the minimals attack only the rebars. And the integrated steel manufacturers say, that's fine. They're just going after the, the sort of lowest margin product that they've had it. And so over time, from 1975 to 1980, the minimals just focus on the rebars. And the integrated steel manufacturers exit rebars and say, fine, we'll take all the high margin stuff. We're not scared of you. At this point, the mini mills are all mid-sized companies, right? What happens next? 
over time, the minimum is now getting to angle iron. Okay. And there's a sort of consolidation there, and the integrated steam manufacturers say, fine. You know, you've taken one market segment, you've taken the next one, but we have still like higher margin products to sort of play with. And so we'll do structural steel and sheet steel. And over time, the minimums take over structural steel, and over time, they take over sheet steel. And today, there's only one integrated steel manufacturer left in the US. So that is the opportunity for mid-sized innovators. That you can take an existing technology, you essentially find a new business model, and you eat up the market and take on the big guys. Now, the counter side of this is why cannot uh, incumbent, a large company, do the same, right? That's the question that you would ask. Why would uh, a Kodak not see the digital camera opportunity? Why would like an incumbent, why would an integrated steel manufacturer not do the minimum? So this is a classic case from my work. So I worked with Microsoft China. This is a fantastic product which was developed by Microsoft Research in China, which never saw the day of light. It was called Phone Plus. It was a phone which was supposed to be acting as your entry-level PC, all priced at a price point which a Chinese teenager could, could sort of afford. And this product was developed entirely by Microsoft Research in Beijing. It was test, pil uh, test piloted, marketed, and it got killed. And any guesses for why this was killed? Exactly. So Redmond didn't want this. And which part of Redmond didn't want this? The smartphone division. So that is the problem of a large incumbent. They have these institutionalized incentives for managers to pursue the current products. And that's why it's very difficult to be an incumbent and disruptive. And that's why there's a huge opportunity for companies like you. So finally, let me uh, come to my last sort of story, which is a fascinating story from my research. So I, I worked with the CSIR lab, I'm sure like Many of you, if not everyone, has heard about Raghunath Mashirkar. Uh, so this is the lab that Raghunath Mashirkar sort of managed, National Chemical Lab in Pune. And in the, till, till about 1994, NCL or any of the CSI labs, which is like dormant government bureaucracies writing these patch reports on import substitution doing nothing. And between 1994 and 2003, they had more US patents than all Indian private firms put together. In actually, in, in 2002, they had more what's known as PCT patents, patent cooperation treaty patents, even compared to Samsung. So pretty commendable thing for a government, uh, for, for a government body, which has great human, you know, resources. So uh, you know, many of you probably have relatives, especially in the older generations, working for the CSI lab. I think this is a fascinating story, and this. This is really a story of intellectual property commercialization and thinking about the world as your market for intellectual property. So you are all you know, great mid-sized Indian companies, but you should not think about just you know, India. So what the National Chemical Lab really did, and I, I've spoken to Dr. Mashir for several times on this journey. So in 1994, you know, post the 1991 Indian crisis, the, the, the government was slashing the, the budgets for all these labs. So he really wanted to figure out a way of generating revenue. So what he did was with three scientists, they worked on polymer condensation in, in, in NCL Pune. They had no idea who to buy this, but they just straight, straight away landed it at the doors of GE in the US. And they had four like cold calls saying that this is new technology that we have. Does it make any sense to you? And the first three meetings were pathetic. And what happened just opportunistically at that point was GE was G was buying this, this chemical called uh, THPE from a company, German uh, multinational called Coaches Felonies. And they were the monopoly supplier of THP at that point. And they just increased the prices 40% because they were the monopoly supplier. And so G looked at one of the patents that uh, NCL had, one of the US patents, and said, you have an alternative process for THP. I'll give you a trial order. And that trial order became $8.5 million over like five years. And eventually, THP is now out of the roles of G. So this is just thinking about creating intellectual property for the world market. So as you know, great Indian mid-sized companies, you have an opportunity of disruption in India, take on the incumbents, but also think about the world as a state. So with that, I'll just uh, draw the other time. I'll, so the, the other thing I'll, I'll add in the, in the CSI story is that it's really a story about leadership. It is, because 
what uh, Dr. Mashirkar did was, so he took over the entire CSI portfolio in, in, in 1996. And he, he gave this amazing incentive plan for his scientists, because some of the older generation CSIR scientists were just amazing people, very, very smart people. Uh, and he said that if you are able to file a patent and license the patent to a multinational, you get 40% of that, that, that revenue. And given that the salaries of the CSIR scientists were all mandated by the, the pay commission, the sixth and the seventh pay commission, that couldn't be changed. But if you do this and you earn in dollars, that's a huge bump up on, on on, on, on your take home salaries. But interestingly, for the first five years, there was no impact because there were several lab directors in labs like you know, IICT in Hyderabad, CCMB in Hyderabad, who were extremely opposed to this, uh, this view that we should create intellectual property for the world. In fact, Mashirka was criticized for selling out India's labs to the world. And so only after Dr. Mashirka was able to replace the lab directors at several of these labs, that the real sort of like patenting and licensing stuff. So to summarize, I would, these are my four messages uh, of like, uh, you know, just a sweep through of, 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 of big innovation trends. But, you know, think about your strategic hinges as you get ambitious and think about diversification. And strategic hinges, once again, are where can you take your existing product and find a product opportunity, find a market opportunity, or just a capability opportunity. So if you're good in decapitalizing, use that in autos. If you put in you know, educational services, use that, I don't know, banking, some. So, and the second uh, message is, as mid-sized companies, it's really a blessing to be a mid-sized company because you have none of the baggage that the incumbents have to oppose disruptive innovation. So you are the disruptors, actually. Third, of, uh, third message, think about the world and uh, as your stage, and to do that, sincerely think about uh, your intellectual property management strategy. So India now is part of the PCT, uh, it's very effective uh, to sort of like file a, a, a global patent sitting in India at a very reasonable cost. So think about that. And finally, you know, innovation cannot be done by people, uh, you know, sitting in the benches. It's, it's done by people sitting in the benches, but it has to be handheld and motivated from the top. So there's a huge role in innovation. So with that, I'm going to close. Breathing the jet lag. He just flew into Calcutta last night or the night before and then took a flight uh, to come into Delhi today. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Can I request Pama to uh, give a little token of appreciation and then we move along to the awards ceremony aspect of the agenda? Thank you. Thank you. Can I request both of you to be on stage, please, to give out the first set of awards? We're going to start with the first batch of awards. We're going to give awards to 30 companies in no particular order except for when they registered, when they came in, and alphabetically from there. The next set of companies will come in batch two. Uh, a round of applause for all our winners, please, before we begin the award ceremony. So first up, can we have Akash Chaudhary from Akash Educational Services to come up and get the award? Akash of Educational Services, one for the category marketing. for 
and safe infection suit. Can you hear me the back now? Yeah. Can you hear myself? Uh, just to show how many of you were here in the pre or what, post lunch session, pre tea session. So that's about 45, 46%. I'll show you the size. So uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, I'm going to do something that I'm doing for the 2743rd time, which is to introduce my company to all of you. Uh, so just bear with me for about 10 minutes. So then, after that, there's something that we, and, and therefore the 46% of the people who are here this afternoon is probably it is a repetition for you. Uh, but then the next 20 minutes is something that we didn't speak about in the afternoon, which is two brands that we've built over the last one for over the last 30 years and another one for the last 15 odd years. Uh, both brands, uh, <coughs> one would still qualify as an SME. Uh, the other has become a big brand, but when it came to us last uh, 25, 30 years ago, it was certainly an SME. <coughs> so just a little bit about us for people who are not here this, uh, uh, this morning. Uh, we have about six offices in India uh, and 11 satellite offices. Uh, these are some of our key clients that we work with. Uh, Unilever, Castro, Vodafone, Cadbury, Asian Paints, Fitline, Study Paul, CF, Tax India, Economist, Kimberly Club, so on, so the Fox Um But like I said uh, this morning as well, and keep uh, repeating this very uh, important thing is that uh, what we're proud of is not all the clients who work with us, but the length of time that they work with us. So, Cadbury, for instance, uh, we've ma we started managing Bond Vita 61 years ago. Uh, Unilever, we've been working for oh, roughly 40 years. Tentacle for about 35, 37 years, and Vodafone for now for about 14, 15 years. And there are many, many brands like this in the company who've been with us over 10 years. <coughs> uh, there was a big debate that happened about five years ago, which was about saying, does advertise, do advertising agencies just create work? and get creative for the sake of being creative, or is there some commercial aspect to it? Do they really do commercial art, or is it just art? Um, as an agency, we never believe that creativity is just for creativity's sake. It has to deliver business results for clients like yourself. Uh, and therefore, uh, we've always uh, built uh, the agency and its credentials on the back of work that works. And therefore, what we call trying constantly to scale the twin peaks of creativity and effectiveness, both you know, kind of two sides of the same point. As an agency, we are India's most 
awarded. The agency as can. So India's most awarded creative agency in India. We've been uh, the creative agency of the year <coughs> 17 out of the last 18 years. Effectiveness award. Uh, EPIS is a global uh, 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 global award. Its India chapter is obviously called the EPIS. It's given to brands. Uh, it's given to agencies that manage brands uh, and are able to do work where they're able to prove that they've contributed to the top line and bottom line of these brands. Work across agencies are, is reviewed at the end of the year, and we've been agency of the year for the last four years running. This year's award, or 2013 award, would be held on Jan 15, 2013. <coughs> uh, and if you look at the tally between us and the other agencies here, about, you know, like last year we were at 280 points if you add up all the gold, silvers, and bronze. Uh, the second agency was 65. So we're four times more effective uh, than the next agency. Uh, we are obviously also the uh, uh, leading contributors to uh, the wins that OVB has in the Asia Pacific region. We won what the most difficult award uh, in effectiveness, which is the IPA, which is run out of the UK. You have to prove that you've contributed to the bottom line of the brand. We spoke in the afternoon for the people who are here on the Cadbury Daily Mills, the whole Kuch Mita Ojai campaign for the last seven years, uh, and how it's contributed to the brand's bottom line and top line. Uh, that's something that we won in last year, gold. That's the first ever gold that's been won in the country. All this makes OBB Mumbai, which is the office I run, uh, the most effective agency office in the world. For two years running, it's an award that's given out of the CAN uh, Advertising Festival. So in the year uh, 11 and 12, we were number one. In the year 10, we were number two. So it's kind of moving up to that sense. Uh, but I think what's most important for us is to be most valued by people like yourself, the most valued brands. So there's a survey that's conducted by Economic Times and uh, this is Brand Equity. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, AC Nielsen, where they go and uh, interview marketers like yourself, asking them to rate agencies on six or seven parameters, quality of account management, quality of creativity, quality of integrated communication, quality of financial management, quality of strategy, uh, planning, so on and so forth. And we've been uh, the number one agency across all parameters for nine years in a row. <coughs> uh, it's not, and it's extremely important uh, 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 for all of you here uh, that you know people believe that advertising means this big budget television commercial. I spoke about in the afternoon as well, saying that in today's day and age, uh, it's not necessarily that has to happen. Uh, and therefore, we're a full service agency, not just doing classic advertising. But also, uh, you know, OB1, which is India's largest digital advertising agency, there's digital there. Social media is run uh, out, of an, uh, out of a division for social at OBB. New at OBB is all the media planning and buying on digital. Geometry Global is our activation, urban and rural, uh, and experiential marketing, and only public relations office is PR. So it's a full service agency, uh, and uh, at different points in time, uh, brands and businesses like yourself may choose not to actually go on and do the big budget television commercials, but actually use aspects of the communication mix which potentially could you know, uh, be used to leverage whether your brand is at that particular time in the market and what it's trying to achieve. I'm just going to show you uh, four or five commercials that uh, you kind of made, and then I'll take you on to the two case studies.
before. Uh, we're very well in terms of you know, being established as the best network in the country. I don't think it is anymore. Um, that's another story. Uh, but I think what, what's most interesting is the, the price of the pug. The dog went up five times. Yeah. <laughs> and they were not available. It was, and there was so much demand for the pug that uh, they were uh, kind of outsold in the country. And that, that was kind of an associated benefit that, you know, that industry got out of this campaign. This is something that we did last year, <coughs> this year. This was in 15 minutes, take you through two case studies, two grants uh, that we've built over the last, like I said, one over the last 30, 35 years, one in the last 15 years. And I, as, but before I start, I just thought I'll leave you right in the beginning as you see the work, because I didn't want to bore you with, uh, you know, lots of slides, etc. I did that in the afternoon. I just thought in the evening, it should kind of, you know, keep it easy. Uh, some of the key messages and some of the patterns that you should watch for when you see this work. Clearly, there is uh, what we're beginning to call in today's day and age, what was called creativity or a great idea in the past, or what's beginning to get called now contagious content. Content that just kind of begs for a reaction, content that sparks up a conversation. So creativity, ideas, it's still in the heart of what you're calling innovation, it's the heart of uh, uh, you know building a brand, uh, whether it's an SME, a large brand, doesn't matter. But it's the it's the part of the idea uh, that will get you to where you want to get to, and and it can only be limited by the extent of your own imagination. And we spoke about it in the afternoon. That's one. Secondly, there's the element of consistency. There have been many brands, many companies, many organizations who started off, uh, you know, with a lot of escape velocity behind behind them. But after two years, you know, either they got bored or that kind of change priorities, they're not inconsistent with the way they've built their brands. And, and over a period of time, we realize that it kind of starts hampering their growth uh, and restricts. They're not able to kind of you know leverage their own potential to the maximum. Uh, third thing is very, very, very important, and, and let's borrow from what you said in terms of strategic things, is for an agency, for a client, for a brand, what is communicated? Apart from all the strategic changes that you may have in regards to you know, production and, and, and all of that, is the consumer. I think an understanding of Indian culture, understanding the Indian consumer, even as, a, as, a, as an organization leader, as a brand owner, is extremely important. The study called Bus Commercial comes from observation, comes from uh, you know, just looking around you and saying, okay, what in the environment today can I connect my brand Fevicon to so that it just, you know, is so associated with the people of this country so the brand starts enjoying an affinity and love beyond what the advertising was trying to achieve, yeah, which is just, in, in a sense, message comprehension. Really. So creativity, uh, consistency, uh, consumer, culture, I think these are the big uh, messages that I would leave you with with the two case studies that I'll share with you. But the most important thing, I think as an SME, and I know it's, it's kind of uh, a chicken and egg uh, situation, it's kind of ironical for me to say this, but it's really to think big. If we're going to continue thinking small, we're going to remain small. Uh, you said something along the same lines. It's very Fevicon is the first brand I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, 
Came to us 35, 37 years ago, and there was nobody. They had, they were white, adhesive, blue. Uh, we, I wasn't there, of course, but uh, the the stories are legendary. Uh, there was, walks in a man with, uh, you know, a can of white glue, and he says, uh, "I've called it Savicol, and I want to make this the best glue in the country." Or rather, I have the best view in the country, but I don't want people to tell me that this is the best view in the country. I want this to become the most loved brand in this country. Because if it's the most loved brand in the country, then people will automatically buy it. I want this brand to become part of culture. That was the brief that was given. It was 37 years ago. Um, and one of the one of the conversations that we've had, we've had with the client at that time was, that, listen, I mean, Telecom is really sold to the carpenter. And it's the carpenter who is the key decision maker on what glue or adhesive he's going to pick up over the you know, tables and chairs that you're sitting on. So what is the need, what is the reason to even advertise this product? As long as we do you know, carpenter meat, we get by, we get our sales. But this, like I said in the beginning, was not about sales. It wasn't about thinking small. It wasn't about what's going to happen next two, three months. It was about saying, 20 years later, this brand should be the most loved brand in the country. And therefore, I'm not going to advertise or do stuff only for carpenters. There is lots of stuff you do for carpenters. And I'll just share that with you. But I will talk to people in this room so that when your carpenter brings a telephone can to your house, you're not throwing him out saying, what shit are you got? Yeah? They say that. Uh, I mean, you can imagine if, if and I was saying this to somebody in the afternoon, you can imagine if your office administration guy was trying to send your important documents through some Jamnabai courier, you would sack him. But it's because he comes to says I'm sending it to FedEx or DHL that you're comfortable. And it's pretty much the same strategy that IBM has deployed. It's pretty much the same thing that we did with Telecom. So I'm just going to share with you, uh, it's I think four or five commercials, uh, one of which I've already shared, so I'll skip them, it's the bus commercial. But really you started off by just fundamentally uh, establishing the functional superiority of the brand as to what it really does in terms of performance. And then you start, uh, once that is established, and that's another learning, once that's established, you move it to the next level and start building emotional bonds with the viewers. Okay? Yeah. So this was, uh, I think, from the late 80s to the mid 90s. That's the time people, you know, didn't make ad television commercials every year. You make one, and then you kind of use it for five, six years. Yeah, now of course you can make three, four sometimes. Uh, and then there came a time we said, okay, this is functional superiority has been established. Now what do we do? And uh, I mean, they basically came to this idea saying that, you know, even if there's a shadow of telecom that falls on somebody, there's instant stickability or bonding that happens. Yeah? And this was a commercial that we uh, did in 1997. I was fortunate, I was a young senior account executive at that time. And uh, I was fortunate I worked on this campaign at that uh, point in time. So that's an interesting story around this channel. They said, we are researching it with carpenters in Gujarat. I said, why would you research it with carpenters in Gujarat? You never researched anything in my carpenters in Gujarat. He said, no, 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 because there's an egg in the film. 
and we are not sure that the Gujarati carpenter is going to be happy with the fact that we are going to keep an egg in the fridge. So anyway, I went to Piyush, who was the chairman then, still the chairman of the company, most many of you may know him. And I said, listen, Piyush, this has happened, I don't know what to do. So he said, don't worry, when we go for the next meeting, I'll talk to Madhukar Bhai and sort it out. So next meeting, we go into the meeting, we finish everything else. And as we are leaving the room, uh, Piyush looks at Madhukar Bhai and says, uh, Madhukar Bhai, I believe you chickened out of the egg commercial. He said, no, 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 we never chickened out of the egg commercial anyway, then he eventually got made, which is what he's saying now. Um, so yeah, don't over-research anything, you know, just kind of go with the gut. Uh, what you like. Benches, tables, etc., for them 
uh, all obviously sponsored by Credit Board. This happens every 20th, uh, every year on the 20th of December. So as we speak, it, it should have gotten over today actually. Yeah, and then there's a furniture book that's set up, you know, which are designed, uh, inspired by either carpenters or uh, someone else, but made by Pericol, or made using Pericol, by the Pericol carpenters, put into a book, and you could potentially ask for these designs. Yeah. And if you look at uh, their sales between 92 to 96, the category was growing at 10%, they were growing at 55. Between 98 and 03, category was 8, they were growing double. Between 3 and 12, they were growing at 9, the category was growing at 8. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it mentions in popular culture, everybody knows the most recent being double 2 and the Freddy Paul K song, uh, which was created by the client in the agency. Yeah. Someone 75% market share despite being at a 30% premium. Yeah, so the revenue to is very, very profitable. The other brand is Amaron. Again, same principles, I'm just going to run you through the work. Again, had to uh, uh, establish functional superiority to begin with. Once that set, once people believe that your brand is an authentic, credible, performing brand, then you take it to the next level and start building emotional bonds for the brand. However, without losing out on what is the key message that you want to build consistently over a period of time. This is a chicken leg. Chicken leg and silver foil. And that is sulfuric acid. This is the same reaction that happens inside your car battery. Ordinary batteries can't take it. But Amron has silver inside. Amron highlight batteries. Last long. Really long. This was in 98. Uh, and in 2013, it's still on the proposition. This is the same reaction that happened. Still on the proposition of it being the lo longest lasting battery because it's got silver inside. Uh, we started with the product demonstration to establish functional security, but then have gone on to do two more kinds of commercial. Let's show you. That's going to tell you. There's a spell error there. Two Japanese in middle management race, one with brains, one with pain. For five star was on finance money, Rabbit brought for Paz Lamborghini. He drove on 125 speed, was in the lead, so for dog for charge. Lamborghini refused to start, Ramajane why? For toys came first with him, told secretary and all the lead. His car was right, but he was wrong. My camera on last long, very long, oh no, last long, very long, last long, very long, eh, tang, eh, tang, eh, tang, eh, tang, eh. Okay. This is the first brand that ever used uh, animation in this country to do like said, I mean, we've seen it in movies. No brand has ever done that. It's put out again. You don't want to this one here. to do new things, you know, to go after and invest behind stuff 
that nobody has done, ever done it before. And I think, I'm sorry to say this, but big, big, the bigger multinational companies, like you said uh, in, in, your, in your speech, uh, have kind of lost the ability to uh, do something like that. So the last message, if at all, that I would like to leave behind for all of you is just courage. I mean, keep the courage that you're doing, and everything else that you do has a lot of courage. So now, I think it's time, like you said, to move out of the small and medium enterprise league and become the top 100 largest companies in India. And uh, we are happy to help. I'm using a waterfall line, so I have to plug all my friends over there. Thank you very much. My fault. Okay, now. We're requesting Naveen and his team to uh, please stay through dinner. So all of you who want to chat up with what we can do for you uh, are most welcome to do so, and we hope you take that opportunity. We will quickly move on to the next batch of awards. In this one, we have 25 companies. And uh, to give away these next batch of awards, can I please request Mr. Puneet Motgil and Mr. Alok Mittal, who were on our jury and who helped us through this rather difficult process of going through the forms. I don't know, Puneet, I think did some 80, 100 forms. Some, some of you gave us forms which are eight pages long. And these gentlemen have read those forms. So thank you very much for your, for your participation and for your encouragement through the process. The first company up is Canton Biotechnology and they have been awarded for both the product and responsible business category. We have Canton Biotechnology. You know, we had 10 categories but we didn't feel the need to force fit companies into 10 categories, 10 companies each in each category. We went by the merit of the innovation. And if there were 30 companies in the technology and product which have made it, so be it, and 10 in the practice. So that's why you see some of the categories coming over and over again. Gujarat Pipa Park for corporate governance.
Sunshine Hospital for the Marketing and Responsible Business Category. Ujjivan Financial Services for Responsible Business. Remedies for products. BSCC for people practice. Industries for Technology. Tree House for Products. Uh, Puneet and Alok who are here and the others who are not. 
I do want to thank all of you on behalf of my and media and also the institute. Uh, we are going to keep doing what we have mandated ourselves to do. I said that earlier in the afternoon. But our mandate to ourselves is to continue to celebrate what's right for the world. Uh, there is a video that I would have loved to show you, but another time. It's a video by a gentleman called Joyce Jones, who's a National Geographic photographer. It's titled Celebrate What's Right for the World. It's full of nuggets, and I think any of you who get a chance should take a look at it. But one of the lines amongst many that has stayed with me is that if you focus on what's right, it gives you the energy to fix what's wrong. And I think this room is very representative of that spirit. Instead of constantly getting pulled down by everything that's not right, somewhere in this room I sense an audacity and a humility together. And I hope that we keep that alive and kicking year after year as we do what we do. I hope that you continue to do what you do. Thank you once again for being here and here's till next year. Thank you. Can we request all the winners to come up on stage, please? We'll do a quick group photograph. All the winners, please. Could you please? <laughs>